Good morning. It's actually kind of a miserable morning. It's cold. It's about 45 degrees, but it's windy. It's very windy, so it feels much colder, and it's just, it's, it's a rough way to start the day. It's just after sunrise. I'm waiting for the sun to emerge from behind this cloud over here. There's this thin little wisp of cloud that's been blocking the sun for about 10 minutes. But I'm at a really, surprisingly, interesting and unique place. I'm in southeastern Oregon, and uh, people call this the, the Yellowstone of Oregon, for obvious reasons. And there's the sun. Ooh. Anyway, there are lots of these little vents and uh, hot springs and little bubbling pots of water. Let me show you some of the interesting little geological features here. There's kind of a lower geothermal area and an upper geothermal area. That was all in the lower area and I'm now walking back up to the upper one which has some larger pools. And along the way between the two you'll pass by little what seem to be dormant vents or holes like this. Here's the uppermost spring and the largest. It's kind of a miniature and less dramatic grand prismatic spring. It's multicolored, the water is. It's kind of hard to see it with the lighting the way it is and uh, with the, the ripples on the surface of the water, but it's pretty colorful. Like it's kind of brownish, orangish around the edges and it gets more green or blue as you go toward the middle. As I understand it, that has to do with bacteria growth. Uh, there's more bacteria toward the edges where the water's a little bit cooler, I believe, and then where it's hotter in the middle, less stuff can grow. They say that this pool is too hot to soak in. One guy died in these hot springs. He died from hypothermia. That's what I read online. I don't know how you die from hypothermia at a, in a hot spring, but he managed it. And then also, I know dogs have, have been injured or died by jumping into the water here, so if you visit here with your dog, keep a good leash on them. Below that main pool, that largest pool, there's a little trickle of water that leads into this pool. This seems to be a more accessible and I think less dangerous soaking pool. I think you're still not supposed to soak here, but the temperature is more reasonable and uh, there are various chemicals and things like arsenic, high levels of arsenic in the water, so even if the temperature is, is reasonable, you still might not want to soak in here. I think a good general rule of thumb for living is to not marinate yourself in poison. And uh, there is one other little, little uh, thing up here that I want to show you above these two soaking pools that you're, again, you shouldn't soak in them. There's this little dome this broad little dome, and then at the top of the dome is this little sinkhole. And this is probably five feet across this way, ten feet across this way, and ten feet deep. It reminds me of, I think it was called Diana's Punch Bowl in Nevada. That's a much larger version of this sort of thing, but I think it's probably the same geological formations, the same thing geologically speaking. When I was doing research for this trip, I saw some people refer to this again as Oregon's Yellowstone. 
and then I saw some other people say this is nothing like Yellowstone this is this is garbage you shouldn't visit it I live an hour and a half from Yellowstone I've been there a bunch and no I mean this isn't Yellowstone but pretty cool I'm surprised I think this is better than I expected it to be really really neat place this place is called Mickey Hot Springs by the way I don't know if I mentioned that or not I don't remember if I mentioned that or not I thought this gate here was kind of interesting. I feel like every gate on public land that I run into in the American West is different. No two gates are the same. With this one, I saw this big lever here and I thought, okay, you have to pull the lever back and that pulls these back and then you can open the gate, but then nope. I saw that this little thing needs to be pushed up first and then you can pull this pull this, which pulls this, which pulls these, and the whole little Rube Goldberg machine masquerading as a gate. Ooh, that wind. It's only 7.30 in the morning, but I feel like I've been riding in a convertible with a top down all day. I feel very wind swept. Ooh, okay, on to the next destination. Welcome everyone to one of the more obscure deserts in the United States. This is an old dry lake bed called the Alverd Desert. And you can drive wherever you want on it, which is a lot of fun. The surface of the lake bed is this dried, cracked mud. Pretty hard, but not so hard that my car couldn't make tracks in it. And this place is reminiscent, of course, of the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah, but this isn't salty. This is just dried mud out here. And over to my left here is Steens Mountain, which I think is one of the great mountains of the Western United States. The best thing about this mountain is that you can drive up it you can drive up the other side and it's an incredibly scenic drive. You can drive almost to the top of the mountain. You can drive up to the, the ridge up here. And there are just amazing glacially carved valleys and amazing views. Definitely worth the drive if you haven't done that. There's still too much snow to do that drive at this time of year. I've done that drive once before several years ago. I'll put a link to that video down below if you want to see that. The lake that dried up to form this dry lake bed back in the day, back in the Pleistocene, it used to be a hundred miles long, all along the side of Steens Mountain here. You can camp out here. You can camp anywhere on the seven by 12 mile dry lake bed, which would be great if it weren't windy. Last night, it was really windy where I was, where I was camped, and I was even behind a little, a little rise, a little ridge out here in the open. You really want to make sure that the weather is good before you come camp out here. Otherwise, you're going to have a rough night. And apparently the stargazing out here is just incredible, which, of course, I believe there is nothing out here. There are no cities of any size out here. You definitely want to make sure you have gas before you come out here. Amazing place. Really, really beautiful in a, of course, empty, stark kind of way. And similarly to the Bonneville Salt Flats or places like the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. This place, this dry lake bed, has been used for land speed records. Two women's land speed records have been set here. Once, let me see, I have the stats here. Once in 1976 by Kitty O'Neill, who went 512 miles per hour, and once in 2019 by Jesse Combs or Coombs, 
at 522.783 miles an hour. And that latter one, Jesse Coombs or Combs, she was on Mythbusters when uh, when Carrie Byron was on maternity leave in one of the seasons of, of Mythbusters, this woman, Jessie Combs, filled in her spot. And uh, she was also a, a racer and came out here and broke Kitty O'Neill's longstanding women's land speed record. Unfortunately, tragically, she died in the process. She died here in 2019. But Guinness World Records did posthumously verify that she had attained the land speed record before she died. So, tragic, but uh, an interesting little piece of history for this place. Uh, I went about 50 miles an hour across the desert here and that was that was good for me, that was enough for me. And um, you know I pointed out Steens Mountain over here and that's where I'm gonna head to next. There's a road, the main road or highway through the area that goes between the dry lake bed here and Steens Mountain. It's over on the on the side out here and so I'm gonna drive that to access one of the canyons over on this side and uh, go for a hike. This is the starting point of the hike. It's called Pike Creek. So the canyon that I'll be hiking up is over here, but between here and there is private land. This stretch right here is owned by the same people who run a commercial hot spring operation over here called Alverd Hot Springs. I don't think you can see it from here. But there is an easement, so you can you can hike through here. You just can't go onto the land off to the sides. If you pay the hot spring people, I think seven dollars, then you can drive all the way to the start of the trail proper, which I think is about three quarters of a mile. So it'll take me 15 minutes to hike up this road. I'd rather not pay the seven dollars. I was gonna say that I have a lot of time today, but I don't really. I just don't feel like paying seven dollars. So we're gonna we're gonna hoof it up to the mouth of the canyon here. And I think you can see some of the dry lake behind me here. This desert is uh, is made worse by Steens Mountain, which is again the big mountain that I'm walking toward here and by the Cascades and by the Coast Range. And so all of those mountain ranges and this mountain create a rain shadow that makes this area, this desert here, very dry. Of course, the Cascades create a rain shadow for all of Eastern Oregon. So all of Eastern Oregon is drier than Western Oregon. And then you add Steens Mountain to the mix and that creates a smaller rain shadow that, again, has created the Alverd Desert. I'm now at the point where the road ends and the public land and the real trail starts, like right here. And at this spot, there's a camper right here, but next to it, look at that huge boulder with that huge tree sticking out of it. It's a big tree, and that's not a very wide crack. I'm solidly in the canyon now. The trail continues across the hillside over here. Can't see much of Steen's mountain from here, but I assume after I, after I round a couple of bends, it'll open up to me. There's a creek in the bottom here called Pike Creek, and it flows out this way and basically just dries up in the desert out here. And there are native trout in this creek. They're called Lahontan cutthroat trout. You're not allowed to fish for them here, but you can in other locations. And creeks like this, and um, you know, there are more along the side of Steens Mountain here. These all used to flow, again, thousands of years ago, into the lake, the Pleistocene era lake that used to be out where the desert is now. And then when the lake got smaller, as it got smaller and when it dried up, the fish were kind of stranded in these streams, in these canyons, because the creeks didn't dry up. You know, they kept flowing, 
but they became separated from each other because there was no common lake out there to connect them all. And so some of these different drainages evolved to be slightly different. So there were Lahontan cutthroat trout, or there are in here. A handful of miles in that direction, there's a species called the Alvord cutthroat trout, or at least there was a species called that. It's believed that they're now extinct because uh, over the last century or so, cutthroat trout and rainbow trout uh, of other kinds have been introduced into that stream and kind of muddied the genetic waters of that trout because they can, uh, you know, the different subspecies can interbreed. And so it's believed that the pure Alvord cutthroat trout no longer exists, sadly. But I thought that was an interesting little piece of, of natural history of the area. I wish you guys could smell this plant here. It's a beautifully smelling flower. It's kind of like a honeysuckle kind of scent, I would say. No idea what kind of plant this is. Let me know down below in the comments if you have an idea. Here's a closer look at some of the, uh, the flowers on here. The flowers are turning purple on this neighboring one. Really, really pretty and it smells so nice. There's even a little natural arch on the side of the, the cliff over here. It's like an eye watching out over the desert. Oh, it's actually a double arch. I couldn't really see that from the last viewpoint, but you can clearly see the two different holes there. Been hiking for about two hours now and gained about a thousand feet of elevation and uh, I've hiked just under three miles. Been hiking pretty slow, largely because I don't really have anywhere to be on the mountain here. Like there's no destination in particular that I've been hiking to. The trail continues on past here and goes up around this this bowl here and then up, up to the top of this slope up here somewhere. But uh, I think this is a good turnaround point. I wanted to at least get as far as getting a good view of, uh, of the upper face of Steen's Mountain here. Beautiful place. And then looking back out toward the mouth of the canyon, you can see just a, a little bit of the dry lake bed out there. I just had a little bag of Cheez-Its and a, a cracker kind of thing and uh, I'm gonna turn back now. I'm not gonna film most of the way back, but there is one more thing that I wanna see. I kept my eyes peeled for it as I was hiking up. I didn't investigate too closely, but you know, I looked around and I, I couldn't find it, but um, I just looked it up. I, I get a faint uh, phone signal up here, so I was able to look it up and find some more information. I think I have a, uh, a potential location for it, so if I find it, I'll let you know and I'll show it to you. Otherwise, I'll see you guys back at the car. I'm now back in the bottom of the canyon, and I realized as I was thinking about it, hiking back down here, that there are actually a few things that I wanted to see, uh, or try to find. And uh, I'm at one of them right now. There used to be several mines, active mines in this area, in this canyon. They've all shut down, but there are still remnants of it, of the mining, and here's one little piece of that. This is an old track used for carts to haul rocks out of the mine. That's neat. Uh, I saw another piece of it over here. Let me show you that. 
I just saw a snake in here, guys. I wasn't recording, but uh, that's fun. It was not a rattlesnake. Not sure what it was. Anyway, here's the other other piece of of metal here. I get asked a lot about snakes, and I see several a year usually. I saw more when I lived in Utah. There were a lot of snakes and a lot of rattlesnakes in Utah. I don't see as many now that I live in Idaho, but I still see some every year. I also get asked about scorpions and bears and mountain lions. Scorpions I hardly ever see. Bears I see one or two or three a year usually, sometimes while hiking, sometimes from the road. And mountain lions I've seen one in my life. It was in Utah several years ago. I'll put a picture of that here. It's one of my favorite pictures. I, I was exploring a canyon. I looked up and I, I saw a, uh, a mountain, lion, mountain lion kind of crouched and staring at me. And I've just found the second thing that I wanted to see in this area. So on the way up, I passed by this Steens Mountain Wilderness sign. And what I didn't do was look to the left once I got to this sign. If I had, I would have seen this little wooden shack. It's thought that this shack was used to store dynamite to safely keep it away from everything else. And they mined uranium in this area, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that, but that's actually in pretty good shape. I believe this dates back to the 1950s or 60s. The walls of the shack are still looking pretty good. Yeah, the whole thing actually is is in decent shape. Two walls of the cliff here form two sides of the shack. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that higher up there I ran into some other hikers and I asked them if they knew what those flowers were and uh, they're both lupin. So I think the blue one was just regular lupin and then the yellow one they said was yellow lupin. Not sure if that is true, but that's what they said, that's what they told me. It's now several hours later, about five hours later, in fact. I've driven a few hundred miles, a couple hundred miles in that time, and I'm obviously not in the desert anymore. I'm up in the mountains at this beautiful, beautiful campsite. Here's where I'm parked, right on the edge of this beautiful little meadow where there are a couple of deer grazing. And there's a creek running by camp. It's just gorgeous here. I feel like this is my own little mountain hideaway. I haven't seen anyone else up here. There's room for like a dozen people camped right in this area. Uh, there are a bunch of campsites and fire rings all in the trees behind me here. Really, really beautiful place. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end the video. I have about an hour of daylight left, so I'm just gonna relax, enjoy the view, Enjoy watching the deer out in the meadow over there. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed the day's adventures. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions. And I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.